I welcome you to Agape Life Church. We're excited to have you all here with us this morning. Uh, we're in the midst of a series known as the Basic Life Principles, and we've learning, been learning about seven very important and valuable basic life principles that allow us to understand how God wired us, how we function best, how we perform best, why we're here, how to reach our purpose, how to operate on a whole different level and become everything that we need to become. How many of us believe that there's just so much more potential in us and there's so much more that we could be accomplishing and experiencing in life, but some kind of way we just can't seem to figure out how to get it out or how to walk into it? Well, these principles t literally take the entire Bible and summarize them into seven principles, categorize them, make them very simple for you to get a grasp on how God has designed us. And the first principle we talked about a few weeks ago was the principle of design, being able to accept how God has created us, accepting our facial features, our race, our background, our, our defects, whatever they may be, learning to understand that the way God created us was not a mistake and there's a purpose to however we were created and we can then be take, take honor and have joy and peace in how we were created. Amen? Amen? And then we went on from design and began talking about authority about God's authoritative structures that he has in place to govern our lives, how we have a governmental authoritative structures in, in some areas. We have church authoritative structures with pastors and church leaders. We have family authoritative structures with the parents and the husbands. And we, we have many different authoritative structures that God uses to specifically create boundaries for our good. Are you all with me? You know, sometimes we are, a lot of times we're deceived when we look at boundaries. We think boundaries are limitations. But when you're driving down the road, just graciously going along, minding your own business, and something happens and you swerve off the road, are you glad that the metal boundary beam is there? Yes, you better believe it. When, if someone's on a bridge, are you glad if an accident should happen and the side rails on the bridge are there? Listen, most people view boundaries as a bad thing, but boundaries always to the wise end up being a tool of protection. Amen? It is a fact that anyone that views boundaries as deception, as, uh, as limitations, is being deceived by Satan and will suffer so much drama as a result of that mindset. So we talked about authority. Authority is where God allows boundaries to be set up. He allows us to, to hear from authorities, to get wisdom and direction. It's a system of governing our lives. And if we don't have a pastoral authority, if we don't have a family authority, if we're not going along the lines of those authorities, we miss the blessings of God on what we do in our lives on a daily basis. Amen? And then we went to talking about responsibility, the principle of responsibility, which had everything to do with having a conscious void of offense, a keeping a conscious void of offense. And we related it to a computer and how a computer, if it's not maintained properly, will begin to gain viruses, won't it? And when it gets those viruses, it becomes sluggish. How many people feel sluggish too much of the time? You don't have to raise your hand because then that would prove a point. But I know many of you, you feel sluggish. And, and when a computer begins to slow down, when it doesn't run like it normally is supposed to run, when it freezes up, you could call that being fearful. When it, when it gets sluggish and it starts to slow down and it won't perform correctly, it's because it has some viruses. And the virus to the human body, the way God has designed us, is allowing people to offend us, not knowing how to respond correctly to offenses, not knowing how to clear our conscience of offenses becomes a virus that begins to corrupt us, slow us down, to keep us from performing according to how God designed us. See, if God designed us, if he created us, if he created a structure, just like anybody who creates a vehicle, when they create the vehicle, they tell you what type of oil you're supposed to put in it. They tell you what octane gasoline you're supposed to put in it. And if you lean to your own understanding and you decide you got a better idea for what should go into it, you can have problems. When you take it back to the dealership because it's broke down, they won't honor the warranty because they said, we told you this is what we said to go in it. Doesn't matter what you thought was a good idea. Doesn't matter what you might have heard from someone else. That was the written rule on how that car was designed. And the way God has designed us, the viruses of offense begin to cause us to become very toxic. Amen? Amen? So let's move forward as we look at the principle today we're going to be studying, which is suffering. The principle of suffering. 
The principle of suffering. See, responding correctly to suffering produces genuine joy. Responding correctly to suffering produces genuine joy. So we don't normally relate suffering to joy, do we? When we, when we see opportunities coming that could cause suffering, what do we normally try to do? We want to run from those opportunities. We want to try to get away from those opportunities. We want to try to find ways to prevent them from coming. And actually, that mindset is the very root of worry. Because we worry trying to prevent potential suffering from coming into our lives. Isn't that where worry stems from? When, when we believe something is going to happen or something is not going to happen that we need to happen that could cause us some suffering, that's where worry starts, is from some perceived or some anticipated potential suffering. So our view of suffering literally determines the level of our worrying. Our view of suffering determines the level of our worrying, and we know the Bible tells us that we are not to do what? Worry. There's only one way we can begin to break out of this spiral of worrying, and that is to change our perspective of suffering. Understanding that when suffering is viewed correctly, it produces genuine joy. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you, that the Bible says to us that may the God of all grace who's called us, a calling on our lives by Christ Jesus, that after we've suffered, that suffering is going to create perfection, suffering is going to create establishment, suffering is going to create strength, and suffering is going to create settling. Suffering. In fact, this word perfect has to do with a mending. It has to do with the fact that through our suffering, God begins to remove defects. Whether they be emotionally, whether they be mentally, whether they be spiritual, God begins to remove defects. And from the word established, where suffering comes to establish us, it means that nothing can shake us. We're able to keep focused, so we're able to be perfected. So through the process of suffering, God begins to remove defects. Through the process of suffering, God begins to establish us so that we're unshakable. Through the process of suffering, we get strengthened, the Bible says, so that we can overcome. And through the process of suffering, when it's all said and done, he says, so that we can be settled. Somebody say settled. 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 Settle, reliable. Able to be counted on so that we can be a light to others. So that we can be what we need to be to other peoples. In fact, Ephesians 3.18 says, maybe that you may be able to comprehend to all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, that, that God, through the process of suffering, through perfecting us and establishing us and strengthening us, allows us to be settled, and through the settling and through the knowledge and wisdom that's been gained through our suffering, we're then able to comprehend to the saints the depth and the width, the power and love of Jesus Christ. Genuine joy is found through suffering. God has a tendency to hide things we seek after in places we would never look for them. Because the Bible is told to us and the truths of the Bible are, are known as mysteries. And he gives those pearls of the mysteries to certain people of certain attitudes that truly have a heart to follow after and seek after him. You know, when we are not able to respond correctly to suffering, the end result is bitterness. When we're not able to respond correctly to things that come into our lives, whatever they may be, that causes us to suffer, the end result is bitterness. When we're, when we're not able to allow ourselves to get free from the offenses, free from the things that, that begin to come in our lives that cause us some form of suffering, whatever it may be, if we don't respond to it correctly, we're going to get bitter. And it has to do with forgiveness, being able to forgive whatever circumstance, whatever situation, whatever it may be, so that we can truly be free of bitterness. So forgiveness is key. You know, God will literally give us a practice session of allowing other people to do things to us that offend us 
so that we can get good at releasing offenders and forgiving so that he can do what he truly wants to do in our lives. You know, when you look at the Bible, God has a way of taking people through things when you watch their journeys that the person or the people around them would have to say, where is your God in this situation? If there is a God, why would he allow you to go through this? Why would God allow Jesus, his son, to come to this earth and be crucified in the, most, in the, in the worst way possible? Why? God has a way of allowing people to go through tremendous suffering. Well, the, the practice field is with our family. The practice field is with people around us. Many of us never reach being able to really allow God to do what he wants to do through us because if he began the process of fulfilling our purpose and the suffering that we'd have to go through on the way to fulfilling it, if we have a problem forgiving all those that have done small things to us that have caused us some suffering, then as God begins to do things that cause suffering in our lives, we begin to get bitter with him. We begin to have unforgiveness towards God because God has allowed suffering and, and we don't have the ability or haven't learned the ability to handle suffering. I will tell you this. There's no possible way to do anything great without suffering. There's no way to avoid suffering. In fact, a mature, wise person has a love for suffering because they understand what the suffering is going to produce. You know what we run towards? We run towards joy, don't we? Anything that we can find that may give us some feeling of joy. We run towards peace. We run towards anything that can give us some type of pleasure. And the running towards those type of pleasures leads to all kinds of defects. Running towards creating a feeling of pleasure, it can lead to drug addictions, can it? It can lead to alcoholism. It can lead to immorality. It can lead to insecurity. It can lead to all types of dependencies because we don't want to have to suffer and we want to find ways to either prevent or get away from suffering. If there's suffering going on in a marriage, then that means that the marriage is not ordained by God in our eyes when we don't understand suffering. If there's suffering going on at our job, it means that we need to find a different job because there's suffering going on at our job. Wherever there is suffering, through the wrong perspective of suffering, we believe it's time to move on. If we have a relationship with someone and something happens to where there's some suffering because of some offenses, we believe that that means that we should cut them off. We run away unconsciously without wisdom from every single opportunity where God hides genuine joy. And you know what? When we run from the suffering, we don't find joy in running from the suffering. We don't find joy in trying to get away from the troubles or the, the, the things that we believe may have. We find no joy in it. We only find misery. We only find guilt. God says genuine joy is going to be found in learning how to respond correctly to suffering. So here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is the ability and the willingness to release an offender emotionally. For you, you emotionally to release the offender for whatever's been done to you, whatever has happened in your life, if it's a person, if it's a circumstance, if it's something God has allowed to happen, having the ability to release the offender emotionally. See, responding correctly to suffering is going to result in joy. Responding the wrong way is going to result in bitterness. Releasing an offender emotionally. God wants us to be able to forgive, not because the person that has done something or the situation that has come our way is right or wrong, or we deserve it, or they deserve it. God wants us to forgive because of the damage it'll do to us. Does that answer that question? I don't know how, I don't want to forgive them. I can't forgive them for what they did. God is not saying forgive someone because they deserve it. God is saying, based on how I designed you, if you don't, it's going to harm you. See, you're pointing to what they did to God. God is like, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the poison that's starting to develop in you because of how I designed you and how offense and unforgiveness is a virus in your body. Amen? Amen. Forgiveness is wanting God to benefit an offender's life. That's what forgiveness is, wanting God to benefit. Whoever offended you, I guarantee you there's some people here this morning already that have been offended. There are people who walked in this building offended. Some people are offended pretty much every minute on the minute. 
every five minutes. Something somebody says, what they look like, what their facial expressions are, whatever. There's something here. Let me give you the answer to what your problem is right now. It's not the person, it's you. I said it's not the person, it's you. Because we have the wrong perspective of suffering. And whenever someone does something or says something or a situation comes up or circumstances, if it creates suffering, we become offended and therefore we become bitter. And we say things like, I can't even be around that person right now. I can't even look at that person in the face right now. I just don't want to talk to that person right now. I just don't because we have the wrong perspective because they caused us suffering. It's being able to respond and deal correctly with suffering that allows us to be able to experience joy. I guarantee you if there's someone that is offended, they are not experiencing joy. There could be someone sitting here right now that's been offended and therefore they are miserable. They are frustrated. They are tired. They are drained. And their joy is going to be found on the other side of responding to the suffering correctly. Amen? Otherwise, joy is hidden from them. Tell your neighbor, I'm the problem. Tell them, I, I just didn't realize it until just now. But I'm the problem. But, but I'm the problem. That's, see, the, isn't, that, isn't that difficult for us to say? Because we believe everybody else is the problem. Do you know what that's called? Pride. That's called pride. You know what the Bible says about pride? That pride precedes a fall. What type of fall? emotional defect and dysfunction. Amen? Amen? Here's where it gets difficult. Once God shows us the mirror that we're the problem, what do we do? Reject his truth or repent and say, forgive me, God, and I forgive those who've offended me, knowing that it's my responsibility to respond correctly. To whatever suffering has been created. You know what God gives you on the other side of that? Genuine joy. Amen? Amen. The next part is understanding some of the causes of bitterness. What causes us to become bitter? What causes us to, to, to be in a position where we have to either seek forgiveness or, or become bitter as a result of it? Well, one of the things that can happen is the same problem in my life over and over again. That can cause bitterness, the same problem, same, I mean, just the same problem over and over and over and over and over again. In your spare time, you can look at Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 when it comes to that principle. But the same problem over and 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 over again can cause bitterness. Let me give you an answer. You know why the same problem can keep happening to us over and over and over again? Because God wants us to learn how to correctly privately, not publicly, but privately correctly respond to suffering. Amen? Don't we respond differently in public to our suffering than we do privately? It's a fact. We respond differently privately to our suffering than we do publicly. Here's what the Bible says. God rewards those publicly for what they do privately. Did y'all catch that? We spend so much time trying to work on our public appearance. God says that's not where the reward is going to be found. God rewards publicly for what's done privately. When no one else is around, when no one else is there, when no one else can see, when no one else can hear, what's our attitude? Amen? Amen. Same problem happening over and over in my life, over again, and then... Here's another thing that can cause bitterness is partial guilt. Somebody say partial guilt. Let me tell you what partial guilt is. You know, I'm upset with Dr. Marusi, but I admit it was partly my fault. Are you with me? So, so unconsciously, I'm actually only able to forgive half of the offense because half of it is his problem, half of it's mine. I'm willing to take some responsibility in this. It doesn't work like that. It takes a mind that says, you know what? I'm the problem, totally. And Dr. Marusi is the blessing. Because Dr. Marusi became a mirror that God used to show me how immature I am in being able to respond correctly to an offense 
that has created the feeling of suffering in my life. That's where the wisdom comes in. What a, what a great maturity to be able to have as we live each day where no matter what offense comes towards us, instead of causing us hurt, it brings us joy. Thank you, God, for reminding me how much more I need to grow. Thank you for showing me where I am right now. Thank you for allowing me to see myself the way that I need to see myself. Amen? Amen. Partial guilt. Attempt at revenge can cause bitterness. When somebody does something to us and we're in a situation of suffering, we want to lash out. We want to find a way to create revenge, whether it be not talking to them, cutting them off, the way that we treat them. That can cause bitterness. Also, temporal values, being very materialistic, greedy, selfish, those can cause bitterness as well. Here's one that most people have no clue about that can cause bitterness, is taking up offenses for other people. Taking up offenses for other people can cause bitterness. Listen, if somebody does something wrong to someone else, I will not allow myself to get upset with the wrong party or the potentially seeming to be wrong party. Because wisdom says that the wrong party is simply a mirror to whoever was the offendee so that they can learn how to respond correctly to suffering. That what somebody else views as wrong could be the very hand of God allowing something to happen so they could see his image in a circumstance or a situation. And here's what happens. If you get offended from things that are being done to other people, you will develop bitterness. And the reason you'll develop bitterness is because you won't understand why it happened. And that's actually the worst level of bitterness to obtain. Bitterness to where you can get no understanding. I don't know why that person did that to that person. You can't get caught up into that because God may have allowed it to happen for a reason that only them and him will understand. Or maybe the person won't even understand it for 10 or 15 years and you may not even be in contact with them anymore. And they may not even remember that you were offended by it to even share with you why that happened. So you keep bitterness on something that happened to someone else that ended up being a blessing to them. But you're still suffering the toxin of bitterness. So another way bitterness can come into our lives is taking up offenses for other people. Well, let's talk about the consequences of, of bitterness. Here are the consequences of bitterness. If we don't respond to suffering correctly, we become bitter. Physical and chemical imbalances. We can have physical breakdowns and chemical back breakdowns. We can have low resistance, the Bible tells us in Numbers 5, 27. You know, some of the things are aching teeth. We can have very hard facial features. Our facial features can become very hard. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that we can have bone diseases and we can have blood affecting issues. The health of our blood can be affected. So we can have physical and emotional and chemical imbalances as a result of bitterness. In fact, we know it's true. There's so many places that tie this principle together because the opposite of getting bitter would be that someone has been forgiving, therefore receiving joy. Correct? When you look at the book of Corinthians, when Jesus is teaching about communion, he says that if you have forgiveness in your heart, don't partake in the communion because some were partaking in communion and as they were partaking in communion, it said some of you for this reason of having forgiveness, unforgiveness in your heart as you're partaking in communion, some of you are sick among us and some of you have even died. Is he talking about the fact that you picked up the glass of wine and you drunk it? Is he talking about the bread that that's what did it? That you, because No, that's not it at all. He's saying that communion is symbolic of unconditional forgiveness. And what he's saying is, is that if you have unforgiveness in your heart, regardless if you take communion and, and drink a wafer and a, piece, and a glass of juice, it has nothing to do with that. It's symbolic of the fact that that unforgiveness can cause you physical harm, even to the point of death. Amen? Amen. Here's another thing that it can cause us. Here's some of the, the consequences of bitterness. Psychological depression. 
Here's a few things that falls underneath of that. Emotional drain. Depression, emotional drain. Bitterness continuously drains our emotions because we're bitter. If we feel like we're just out of it before we even start in the day, we get up in the morning. Look at levels of bitterness. We do all kinds of things to try to increase our energy levels, don't we? Well, you, I, don't have, I just don't have any energy. So people tell us, well, you should try doing what? Exercising. I don't have energy, so maybe you should try eating the right what? Eating the right food. So we do everything else. Whenever, have you ever had someone, when you said you didn't have enough energy, give you the counsel of saying, are you bitter with anyone? Because see, you've already tried eating all the right foods. You've tried to exercise. You've done all you could do. But you still struggle with the bitterness. Or maybe when you started the exercising, and you started the dieting, or whatever you're doing, you were only able to do it for so long because you didn't have enough energy to keep doing what you were trying to do to create energy. Question is, who are you bitter at? Who haven't you forgiven? Who won't you forgive? It? Who won't you forgive? So let me give you some steps real quick of, of how to turn bitterness to forgiveness. How to turn bitterness to forgiveness. Now, you know, in this message, if there's a lot of scriptures and things, if you want to, you can go to our website at Agape life757.com within 24 to 48 hours after this particular sermon and you can actually go back and listen to it again so you can gain everything that we're talking about here today but here are some of the steps that come along with turning bitterness into forgiveness number one repent of temporal values temporal values things like loss of money or loss of reputation we can get bitter because we, we lost our reputation we can get bitter because we lost possessions we lost something loss of money we can get bitter because of these things here's a second one recognize attitudes of ungratefulness we can be extremely ungrateful recognize the attitude of ungratefulness and focus on what God did what God gave to us in his son here's a third one we have to learn in order to be able to turn bitterness into forgiveness, whatever's done or whatever's happened, whatever's going on, to be able to view offenders as God's agents. To be able to view offenders as God's agents. Jesus said as he was going to the cross, out on the cross, that they know not what they do. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Job said as he was going through suffering and losing everything, he said, look, God gave me all this anyway, and God has the right to take it away. They had the right perspective on suffering. They were able to live in joy and prosperity. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. As he'd been lied on and as he had been hated by his brothers and as he went through all he went through, at the end of the day, he said, look, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He had a perspective and understanding that good comes through suffering, that joy comes through suffering. Here's a fourth thing. Thank God for his ultimate purpose through whatever is causing us to feel offended. Be able to thank God. God, I thank you that that happened to me this morning. God, I thank you that that person said that to me. God, I thank you that that person has treated me that way. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for that. And you say, well, I don't know. How can I do that? Because they don't deserve that. God is, again, not interested in whether they deserve it or not. He's concerned about your response to it and what it's going to do to you. See, that's the deception from Satan right there is to get you to keep focus on if they deserve it or not so that he can keep destroying you. A bitter person is a destroyed person. A bitter person is a drained person. A bitter person is an unaffected person. A bitter person is an unproductive person. Here's the fifth thing. Be able to comprehend the magnitude of our debt to God for our willful sins versus the little offenses that people have towards us. Being able to look at how much God has forgiven us and, and how he forgives us of every sin, past, present, and future, as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And as we look at how he's forgiven us, we're able to forgive others. I don't know about you, it makes it very easy for me to forgive anything when I look at how much God has forgiven me. See, let me give you a clear picture on it. To have the inability or the long willingness to forgive someone else is to deny the forgiveness given to you by Jesus Christ. It even falls along the lines of blasphemy, of rejecting 
the forgiveness trying to be given to us through Jesus Christ. One of the ways that we can display a picture of rejecting God's forgiveness is through our unwillingness to forgive others. Amen? Amen. You know what's amazing? We have pointed fingers and we have made decisions about people that we feel are evil, that we feel are this, or we feel are out to hurt us. We have made decisions about them, about who they are, how bad they are, how they shouldn't have done this, how they did whatever have you. And we've painted a picture of them in our mind, and Satan has helped us to paint that picture. But you know what this truth says to us? That we've been a picture of unforgiveness. That what we've been through the process to them, no matter what they did, for God, from God's perspective, we've been nothing but a picture of rejecting the unconditional love of God. Amen? There's some people we need to go back and talk to and say to them, hey, you know what, listen, I was deceived. I've been a picture of unforgiveness. I've been a picture of everything but the grace of God. I've been a picture of everything except God's forgiveness of all of my sin. I've, I've shown no gratitude in how I've operated for how God has forgiven me based on how I've treated you. You have no idea how those words can move and impact the life of someone else. You have no idea how those words can impact your own body. I believe it reverses because it says due to unforgiveness, some of you are sick and some of you are on your way to dying, and some of you are dead. I believe it flips the whole script. That as we forgive, I believe it will start saying, and some of you now are healed. Some of you are going to live longer. Amen? Amen. Here's a sixth one. Realize that God will punish the offender. God will take care of that. You don't have to worry about it. He'll take care of it. That's all coming. They'll get theirs. You'll get yours. Amen? Here's the seventh one. Voluntarily, this is going to just go beyond. This is just for a person who is really, truly serious about allowing God to use them tremendously. Because here's the perspective. Here's how we turn bitterness into forgiveness. Voluntarily invest treasure in the offender. Voluntarily invest treasure. Money, a gift, something great. Matthew 6.21, Matthew 5.41, Luke 17.7, Matthew 5.40. All these talk about the power of turning bitterness into forgiveness and us feeling joy and becoming a picture of Jesus Christ in someone's life, becoming a light in someone else's life through being willing to do something incredible for the person who's offended us the most. You say, well, why would I do any of that? Because it's the only road to joy. Because it's the only road to joy. It's the only road to joy in your relationships. It's the only road to joy in your careers. It's the only road to joy in everything. It's the only road to joy is to learn how to live like that. You know, we begin to judge and belittle people that tolerate people doing things to them over and over. Don't we? We begin to, do you, do you know that those people, I don't care what level it is, and your mind may not be able to fathom it, are some of the greatest pictures of Jesus Christ willingly allowing people to cause him to suffer. If it wasn't for his willingness to suffer on the cross, we'd have no vehicle for everlasting life. If he used his power and, and wiped everybody out as being the son of God, there'd be no sacrifice for us to receive forgiveness, for us to have the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross that covers our sins. Some of the purposes for, for suffering. Here's some purposes why God allows us to suffer. It purifies our lives and motives. It purifies our lives and motives. Are we more a little more humble during suffering sometimes? Purifies our lives and motives. It sets our affections on things above. Here's another purpose that completes Christ's suffering to the laws. Christ came and he suffered. When we become a Christian, we understand that we're going to suffer in this life. And we don't like the sound of that. But when you understand that suffering leads to joy, you begin to welcome it. You understand it's the road to joy. 
You don't get offended by it. You don't get bitter by it. You understand that suffering is the road to joy. It also reveals spiritual ineffectiveness. Sometimes we wonder why our faith is ineffective, is not effective, and why our praying is ineffective. And we wonder these things, but what we're harboring is bitterness and unforgiveness. It becomes a mirror to reveal our spiritual ineffectiveness. It also gives us a spirit of God's glory that when we learn to respond correctly to suffering, the spirit of God, his glory begins to to clothe us and, and illuminate us in dark situations. Here's a sixth purpose for suffering. It opens the door for deeper insights into the counsel of God. Through suffering, we get wiser. Through responding correctly to suffering, we get wiser. And the wiser we get, the bigger perspective we have. The bigger perspective we have, the less things affect us. The less things affect us, the more joy we have. Here's one more thing that God purposes for suffering, is it demonstrates scriptural convictions. It forces us to have to live the way God has asked us to live. Suffering, to respond to it correctly, There's no other way that we can suffer correctly. There's no other way that we can respond to what's coming at us correctly other than the fact that we listen to God's word, be obedient to his truths. I'm going to close with this. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 8, talks about how suffering creates profit. A lot of times we want a profitable job, don't we? We want a profitable relationship. We want profit. We have many different ways that we would tell someone on how to become profitable. I guarantee you none of us have ever shared with someone the way to become profitable is to learn how to respond correctly to suffering. God says that's the key to true prosperity. That's the true to being able to be profitable. James 1, chapter 2 through 8, James 1 rather, verses 2 through 8 says that trials produce a profit in the kingdom, not successes. Here's what it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, in order, and what he's saying is, if you lack wisdom on how to do this, just ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts... Is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Our inability to respond correctly to suffering causes us to be double-minded and unstable. Our inability to respond correctly to suffering causes us to be double-minded and unstable. That's why the Bible scripture we read earlier talks about God wants to establish and settle us, which is the opposite of being double-minded and unstable. So so here's four things that we can learn from from, from suffering that God teaches us through James 1, verses 2 through 8, that we need to learn to love suffering, that we need to start repeating the words, I love to suffer, I love to suffer. Y'all say it with me. I love to suffer. That doesn't even sound right, does it? But let me tell you something. Do you know that that's the standard? That's God showing us? If that feels extremely uncomfortable, that's just God showing us our level of spiritual ineffectiveness. Because suffering is what creates the light of God's word being able to be effective in our lives. Amen? Learn to love suffering. Number two, Understand that it's only a test, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It's just a test. So the suffering is a test. We go into it with a mindset of believing that it's going to last forever. And then sometimes it can seem, or it does last forever. Because how many times do you have to keep taking a test if you keep failing it? Are you following me? You're going to have to keep taking it. A lot of times we're in the test longer than what we have to because we're not responding to it correctly to give us the proper passing grade. Amen? Amen. 
whatever may be going on with us health-wise, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, financially, whatever it is, our response to it is going to determine the length of the test. Amen? Well, what's the test for? Why, why is God giving me a test? What is the reason for the test? Because the test... Because the test is necessary to produce patience. Because the test is necessary to produce patience. Here's a fourth thing. Suffering with the right attitude leads to completeness and perfection. Suffering with the right attitude leads to completeness and perfection. So what's God's word saying to us today? Our inability to be able to suffer and respond correctly causes us to be drained, causes us to be bitter, causes us to be frustrated, causes us to be inconsistent, causes us to go up and down, causes us to have a hard looking face, like the Bible says, amen? Causes us to have all kinds of physical emotions, ups and downs and depressions, all kinds of things we go through because of our inability to respond to the situations that come our way in the right way. Where is joy found? Joy found is when we can love suffering. That's where it is. It's on the other side of loving suffering. See, God, joy is something that God has created and that God gives. And he, here's what he says about his joy. It's unspeakable. He gives unspeakable joy. See, a lot of times we get joy and, and we can talk about it and we can say, I'm happy, I'm excited. We can, that's not the, definitely not the joy of God. That's the joy of the world. God gives us an unspeakable joy. The reason it's saying it's unspeakable is not that you can't talk about it, is that it is not a verbal joy. It's something that is inside of you that bubbles up and boils that you can't contain that takes over your whole body. See, you can easily identify someone who's struggling with bitterness whether they know it or not. You can see it all over them. If they're drained, no matter how much they exercise and eat, if they're constantly lacking energy, whatever it may be, you can relate it to the ability for them, not the ability of being able to respond correctly to suffering that comes in our lives through offenses. Amen? Because somebody's always doing something to get on my nerves. That's the attitude of someone who doesn't understand response, suffering correctly. I can't believe my wife said that to me today. I can't believe my children just said that. I can't believe they did that again. I can't believe this is happening again. I can't believe this is just so sickening. I'm just whatever happened. They just don't understand. Those are the tests that God said just last for a short period of time. And the joy is found in us responding, saying, thank you, God. Amen? Amen. On the flip side, there's some people that we need to ask for forgiveness and some people we need to receive forgiveness from. They might not even know it. But our attitude is an attitude of bitterness. Amen? Our attitude is an attitude of resentment. And I want to share something with you. Until we seek to resolve those things, those things are causing us emotional dysfunction. They're causing us physical pain, physical destruction, until we begin to deal with forgiveness. And it can even kill us. Here's a question that God is asking you. Is what they did worth your life and your health being affected so that you can't even be what you want to be to your family? Is it, is it really worth it? God is saying, I'm just trying to get you to see. I'm not saying what they did was right. I'm not saying they deserve any forgiveness. God is also saying, I'm also not saying that you deserve my forgiveness. But in the same way I have forgiven you through believing in me is the same way that I have commanded you to forgive others. Amen? In the same way there are consequences. Unforgiveness is a sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. Not keeping a conscience void of offense is a sin. Not going to offer forgiveness is a sin. Not accepting forgiveness from someone is a sin. It's a sin. It's the biggest sin you could ever commit outside of not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So if you want to get a hierarchy for sins, 
Sin, the highest level of sin is to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let me give you the next highest level. It's for someone who has received him to not forgive or receive forgiveness. No higher level. Nothing higher on God's list. Many of us want to know, I just feel like God is not hearing my prayers. I, don't, I feel like God is not present. Here's all God is saying. Forgive. Receive forgiveness. Forgive. Receive forgiveness. Because God can't move you any further, there's no need in it. Because you're killing yourself. You're destroying yourself. Whatever he tries to sow into you will be eaten up by the toxins of the forgiveness you have in your heart and your mind towards other people. The blood of Jesus Christ washes us clean of our sins. And that's why we love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because through his suffering, we're forgiven. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to the Lord and get prepared to pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Heavenly Father, we want to come just taking time right now, Lord, to ask that you would bring to our remembrance the things that we may have labeled as frustrations, the things that we may have labeled as nerve-wracking, the things that we may have dis di labeled as discouragements or, or letdowns that are really, in their root, offenses. Let us know today, Lord, that Satan will find a way to have those things le leak into our hearts and our minds any way that he can find possible. And through them, we become bitter. We become, we have the inability to focus and hear and be steadfast and be unmovable in you. We know that you use suffering to remove our defects. So today, Lord, we want to come to you, Lord, stretching to a new level to truly say thank you for my suffering. To truly say thank you, Lord, for my suffering. To truly say thank you, Lord, for my health challenges, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my relational challenges. Thank you for my insecurity challenges. Thank you for my financial challenges. Thank you for my direction challenges. Thank you for the suffering. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the suffering in my life right now. I want you to know healing starts in your ability to look to God and to truly from your heart say, God, thank you for the suffering in my life. Thank you for the suffering I've been through. Thank you for the suffering I'm in now. And thank you for the suffering I'm going through in the future. Thank you for the suffering and thank you for the joy that I will find, the unspeakable joy that I'll find from being grateful in the suffering. Heavenly Father, we choose not to reject your grace and mercy today. We choose not to reject your word today. But we choose to strive and move above our own personal thoughts and emotions to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just as you said to James, we count it all joy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We count it all joy. We look at it as joy. We understand that it adds up, that it accounts to joy as we respond correctly to our suffering. Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus for someone that may be present today, Lord, that just struggles with double-mindedness and uninsurance and, and being doubtful. We pray this morning, Lord, for the person who's just not quite sure about this whole God thing that just feels uncomfortable. Lord, I pray specifically right now for the person who feels uncomfortable as we're standing here praying right now that you would break down the stronghold of deception and set them free, Lord. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus, Lord that you will take us to a new level today, that you would help us to grow, that you would help us mature. Lord, there are hearts and minds that are yearning for your grace, hearts and minds that are yearning for your truth, hearts and minds that are yearning for you today. We pray that you use us to make a change in this place today. Make a change in our hearts. Use your word, Lord, to strengthen us and encourage us and establish us and settle us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to do two things. One, we're going to move to a, another level today. We're going to help you to move past bondage. With your head bowed and your eye closed, eyes closed, we're, we're going to help you today. God is going to help us to move to another level in terms of us receiving Him. 
He's going to help us to learn how to move past the emotion of suffering that keeps us bound. So with every head bowed and every eye closed and every person in this place that has arms that are capable, I'm going to ask in the name of Jesus that you lift both hands as high as you can to the ceiling. In the name of Jesus, I'm asking you right now in the name of Jesus to lift both your hands to the ceiling. And as your hands are extended, as your fingers are as wide as they possibly can, stretching your palms, understand that those hands mean I surrender, Lord. I surrender my will. I surrender my life. I surrender my heart. I surrender my mind. I surrender my past pains. I surrender my hurts. I surrender my thoughts. I surrender everything to you and I give my life to you. Those hands lifted means that I am free of the opinions of other people and what they think about me. Those hands mean I am free of fear that keeps me bound. Those hands stretch and stretch means I acknowledge you as number one in my life and I'm free to worship you. Those hands lifted are hands of worship, hands of honor, hands of respect, hands of praise. It's a highest praise to show God that we love you, Lord, and we surrender all to you and we're nothing without you. Lord, we thank you today. We ask that you bless our hearts. We ask that you break us free of the discomfort, Lord, that we feel as we're lifting our hands, Lord. But there's no one more worthy to lift our hands to than you, Lord. There's no one more worthy to lift our hands to, Lord, even though our muscles may be hurting and our arms getting tired, Lord. That's the pain of suffering, Lord, that we need to learn to love. And Lord, I pray right now that as these hands begin to go down, Lord, as we release these hands, Lord, that you would allow us to experience your joy for being willing to suffer through what may have been titled as embarrassment or, or being uncomfortable, which is all under the category of suffering, Lord. Lord, we give you all honor and praise, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you continue with your heads bowed, there may be someone here today who has never confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart and asked Jesus for forgiveness of their sins. Today you can do that. You can pray that prayer. You can say, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness. I accept your forgiveness and I'm willing to forgive others. I accept you into my heart, into my life, and I ask that you make me into who you want me to be. You can pray that prayer today. It's just that simple. It doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter about your present. It doesn't matter about where you are. He's only looking for a willing heart that wants to allow him to come in. You can pray that prayer right now. It's just a simple prayer. In fact, everyone repeat with me right now. We'll pray it with you today. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. I receive it. I accept it. I ask you to come into my heart and save my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.